Yes. Um, now that doesn't mean, so the question was in thyroid disorders, and I really have to speed it up now, but in thyroid disorders, we have antibodies, but the level of the antibodies don't necessarily reflect the disease, um, you know, whether it's better or worse. You can have a high antibody, the person can be doing better or low. There doesn't seem to be a correlation with that. Um, but um, I have observed that enzymes do tend to lower those antibodies. Or any other nutrition the body needs, particularly to repair the thyroid, because as the thyroid starts to look more like a normal thyroid, then the antibodies, anti the body activation doesn't happen. You see? I visualize it like if this were an organ and it's breaking down, the immune system says, hey, you're not supposed to be there, and it makes antibodies. It starts eating it up. But if you take your nutrition and you build it up nice, these don't do anything. So that's what we do. Okay, and again, I mentioned to you, I do arterial stiffness testing. I happen to do autonomic nervous system testing. I do bone density testing in my office with sonogram rather than irradiation. So when a patient says to me, oh, I think I'll get that one at my doctor's, I'll say, well, that's fine. You know, it's gonna be covered at your doctor, but it's a DEXA scan, it's radiation. We're gonna use sonogram, it's not covered. They do it. They just do it. Who wouldn't? And they should. And we know that bone density measured by sonogram is equivalent to DEXA scan. It's right on WebMD. They, I even stole the reference they have there and stuck it on their website. I borrowed it, borrowed it. <laughs> okay, and um, any questions on laboratory? We're good? Uh, yeah. In the, uh, did you have a question or just fixing your hair? Okay. Okay, yes. Yeah. Ah, good question, Eli. Anyone know the answer? The question was? So checking for folic acid. Let's add checking for B12 at the same time on blood or serum. What is that checking for? It doesn't distinguish it. So you don't know, even if it's normal, maybe it's normal, but it's not methylated. You want it methylated. So you measure homocysteine, because homocysteine, you lower that with methylated forms of, B, of B12, folic acid, and phosphorylated B6, which is in the products here. Not if you have adequate B12. As long as it's, if you have adequate B12, you're not going to cause any neuropathies, which is what you're going. One last question. How do you compare uh, folic acid and folinic acid and folate? Yeah, um, they have some comparable effects. Uh, the methylfolate is the one that's really studied in cardiovascular. We know methylation problems are very predominant in autoimmune disease, so we use that. The folinic acid, interestingly, is um, leucovorin. So have you heard of leucovorin? They sometimes give leucovorin, well, often to cancer patients when their white blood cells tank from the chemo. So again, the same, <laughs> I'm thinking this phone conversation I had with this oncologist, he's yelling at me, how dare you use nutrition my patient, it's a waste of time. I'm like, okay, you mean our patient? I'm like sticking him a little bit. And then uh, I says, well, I noticed he's taking leucovorin, so aha. And he says, what do you mean aha? I'm like, well, what is that? And I can hear the pages over the phone, like, turning. It's, it's, it's high dose folic acid. Folinic acid is what that is. Another nutrient that doesn't work, but somehow brings the white blood cells up. It's amazing. OK, did I answer your question, John? OK. So um, cholesterol. So um, I'm going to leave the rest of this to you just because of time, but, um, but nothing. We're going to go ahead. Okay, celiac disease. So the nutrition for celiac disease, the nutrition for the inflammatory bowel diseases is very similar. Um, obviously with celiac disease, that's genetically a condition where the person does not manage gluten. Uh, they can never manage gluten. They have to be permanently off gluten. And then there's non-celiac gluten, which is a ICD diagnostic code actually, so it's real. So that means that a person can have a sensitivity to, to gluten and not have celiac disease. And by the way, a person can also have a normal small intestine lining. It looks normal under endoscopy, but, it is, um, but it's celiac disease. You know what they call that? Normal looking small intestine with celiac disease. Yeah, and that's true. And again, you got doctors looking in there and they may not see anything because it might be microscopic, which is what it is. It could be macroscopic and it usually will be macroscopic at one point, but those finger-like projections that get eaten away, which are the absorptum cells, that's macroscopic, uh, microscopic. And before you see anything, it could be years. So bottom line is, for celiac disease, you have to remove the gluten. There's no other way around it. However, if you t give your patients probiotics and enzymes, digestive enzymes, and or stomach acid, which is combined in, in these enzymes here, then you break down the antibody gluten 
uh, moieties, they call them, that float around that trigger autoimmune issues in other parts of the body. Like celiac disease very commonly obviously affects the gut, but only 50% 50 of the time. The other 50%, it's extra intestinal. Again, love that term. It's something else, depression, fertility, osteoporosis, anxiety, you name it. Anything can happen when you're malabsorbing. That's what patients have to understand. So um, gluten's got to go. Uh, and, I, and again, just to complete that thought, the digestive enzymes and probiotics are known to improve gluten tolerance even in celiac people who aren't perfect. So it's kind of important. Then there's silent celiac disease, meaning it's clinically silent, meaning the patient doesn't live in the bathroom. Um, but this statement here that endocrinologists should maintain a high suspicion and alertness when a person has celiac disease uh, if they also have diabetes and other endocrine disorders. Endocrine problems and diabetes tend to go along. It's like metabolic syndrome with celiac disease and thyroid also, which I didn't put here. The, and, and I'll tell you, when I first learned that, I had observed it. And again, I thought I had a, an original thought, but I didn't. But uh, there it was again, and I kept seeing it, and it's true. And you just never not, you won't ever not test those correctly, or just assume it in a person. Manage their thyroid always if they have celiac. Manage their hormones, endocrine tincture for just about everybody. There's certain basics that I do, okay? But uh, uh, hair loss, I mean, you name it. I mean, if you're malabsorbing uh, and you can't absorb proteins to form proper hair follicles, you're going to lose hair. So when people say to me, if, I, if you correct this, will my hair go back? I said, if it's related to this problem. It may not be. Or sometimes you fix a problem after it's just too late and it doesn't come back. It's like Lyme disease. You get whacked with Lyme disease, then it's gone. It gets killed by the antibiotic. But the person's not the same. And sometimes they still have the infection. Sometimes they don't. But mostly, I think, it, what I've seen, they've just damaged their nervous systems. And they keep getting antibiotics because they feel better from them. Because antibiotics are anti-inflammatories. They're not necessarily killing any, any more Lyme disease. So anyway, getting off track. So gluten. We have antibodies, obviously. We have gliadin antibodies. We have transaminase antibodies and a couple of others um, associated with celiac disease. And this is the information that I tend to give uh, patients in terms of uh, what foods to eat, what foods not to eat. We won't go through them all here. And uh, you will find iron deficiency, anemia in many people with not just celiac disease, but malabsorption. See, and then with the eating disorder people, you see low cholesterol or on the low end. Then you'll see uh, the MCV a little high and the total protein will be low and they'll be super anxious. They'll have OCD behaviors. You know, you just know it. Um, celiac disease also commonly is associated with H. pylori infection. It should be noted that if you have someone who's declared a celiac patient and they're not responding to gluten elimination, they may actually have cancer, okay? T-cell lymphoma of the gut can be triggered, can be caused by gluten, and could masquerade as celiac disease. And uh, transglutaminase, reticulin, and gliadin antibodies are the three major tests used for that. I won't talk about that. Um, and this is a fascinating connection here. The connection between, first of all, candida and just about everything. You know, when I first started practicing, it was the same thing even then. Everyone had, had candida. Everyone thought they had adrenal. Everyone said they had heavy metals. They were right. <laughs> Most of them are right. Every time I didn't believe them, they were right. So I believe everybody until I prove them wrong. That, that's how I, I start. So. Um, Celiac disease, along with other autoimmune diseases, that's what we're here to talk about today, can, can commonly have overgrowth of candida, and it may not show up in the mouth as oral candidiasis. Maybe it's in their toenails, maybe it's in their hands. Maybe you see it under the microscope. Like when I look at that scope and I see these candida blastospores floating around, I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. You know, and then I experiment with these tinctures, I drop them on the slide and things start to break up. But um, we know that there's this connection here. In fact, According to The Lancet, this is a major medical journal, says that candida, the, the interesting study compares a specific amino acid sequence found in candida, the candida wall protein, and to gliadin, meaning that the, the protein sequence of candida looks like gluten. And that looks like the gut in some people, or the person's thyroid, or their skin, or their hormone tissues. So there's this molecular mimicry thing going on. 
Get that? I didn't make up that term. But molecular mimicry thing goes on, and there's this, this cascade of inflammatory events um, triggered by, by this. Now, people can also get celiac disease later in life, and it may be from candida overgrowth, or chronic exposure to gluten, or both. Just always treat everyone with autoimmune, everyone with candida stuff, which we'll continue to talk about. And I talk more about the mechanisms right here. So the candida kill is a fundamental product for you. Um, some people might respond with a little bit of a regurge with it. Just have them take it with food, OK? And follow it maybe with a glass of water. OK, Crohn's disease, just like ulcerative colitis, this is inflammation of the colon. It also can affect the small intestine. And um, what's interesting clinically is this. A person has antibodies to Saccharomyces cerevisiae in Crohn's disease, okay? That's a key thing. What's so interesting about this is, and, and again, I'm always looking to have some original thought happening with me. Uh, this might be one. Um, I was not aware of anyone using um, Saccharomyces uh, boulardii to molecularly trigger the body to not make the antibodies against the person's gut. See, there's only so many antibodies to go around. They're like soldiers. So if you have a tr an inflammation trigger, and the antibodies are going to the gut, they're producing those antibodies. But if you load the person up with Saccharomyces boulardii, which looks very similar to Saccharomyces cerevisiae portion of the gut, you distract them. Does that make sense? Okay. So Saccharomyces boulardii is not only um, essential for inflammatory bowel diseases, you want to give Saccharomyces boulardii to every person because people are getting um, loaded up with fungal organisms, and uh, the autoimmune population, certainly more than most. And the medical literature on Saccharomyces boulardii is, is unbelievable. For example, it is known to cure C. difficile infection 80% of the time. C. diff kills something like 500,000 people a year in hospitals, and it's caused by overuse or incorrect use of antibiotics. And this, if you give them enough of this, you'll stop their diarrhea as well. Um, what else? Is that a long-term forever? I, I, yeah, I do it. First of all, I'm exposed to these people. Their hands are, you know, uh, everything's got stuff. And everyone's talking and doing their thing. So I take these, and I try to get people on them as well. I do sometimes have to cut things back, depending on how much I'm giving someone and what the deal is. But if I could add that on for someone, I will. Yes, yeah, because this is, this is an antifungal uh, probiotic, but it's also an, an, also an antibacterial one, but differently than acidophilus and bifidobacteria. But uh, yeah, it's distinctly for fungal, really. And what are, what's your CFUs as far as the probiotics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have 5 uh, billion CFUs along with the, uh, the SBC2 product that we have here with the bifidolactis at 2 billion, uh, probably that, for most people, possibly double that, with whey, increases its effects, just like the regular probiotics. And then your, OK, so then your regular probiotic, in addition to that, yes. what, would you, what would be your CFUs for your uh, Just follow the standard dosing okay. on the products. Yeah. Okay. OK. And by the way, the difference between Crohn's disease and uh, you know, ulcerative colitis, this has to do with the way in which the inflammation shows up. Like Crohn's disease has what's called like skip lesions in the colon where there's, there's inflammation and then it's normal, there's inflammation and it's normal, and ulcerative colitis doesn't, and then there's a difference in the, the depth that it goes through the skin, except now the geniuses in medicine say, well, we kind of think it may be the same thing. So, so anyway, we treat it the same, and we throw uh, the gluten stuff in there too, in this very same thing too. We use the paracleanse, we use the candy kill, and um, as far as food allergies, I just want to mention this for a second. You heard it here folks first, first, folks, and that is this. Inflammation will cause false positive allergy tests. So if you're going to run allergy tests on patients, I don't care what type it is, you're going to get a zillion positive tests. And then when the patient doesn't eat those foods, they're going to feel wonderful because they're not eating anything. That's the why they're feeling better, not because of that. If you give them steroids, you'll have all false negative. So until you control inflammation so that the C-reactive protein is about a 1 and the ESR is less than 3, you're not going to get accurate food allergy tests. I think that's a waste of money. Okay. They're mostly allergic to themselves. Um, 
let's see here. I give you some, some suggestions here in terms of uh, people with pain. Have, just sometimes a large glass of water helps someone with, with, with pain of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, soft foods during a flare-up. These are kind of basic things. Sometimes I find that practitioners will miss some basic things and they run right to the supplements. And you know, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, sometimes the dark green leafy vegetables work for people with, with inflammatory bowel disease and sometimes it worsens them. So when people say to me, what's the diet? There must, there ha what's the diet? I, all these conflicting things. There is no perfect diet. There's no inflammatory bowel disease diet. There just isn't. There are some guidelines and then we have to see what works with people. And then they're all over the place with their exacerbations from so many factors. It's going to take a while to work it out. I don't know if, any, if some of you disagree with that, but that's just what I find in my, my particular practice. Okay, and then um, the alcohol, the coffee, all that has to go. Uh, well, yes? Well, fasting does help them. So um, I'm getting into fasting them on the powders because a lot of people are doing fasts that are not nutritionally dense enough and not potent enough with anti-inflammatories and tissue reparative elements. So I might have a person, I'll put them in just a liquid diet with the, the greens, the purples, the reds, the orange, everything, starting them out with a half a scoop of each, mixed together, diluted in water to taste, and they do that depending on their weight between five and seven times per day with plenty of water in between. And I might do that for two days, three days, five days, and then as I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do food introduction again, one or two things at a time. And when you put them on these products and they feel better right, right away, you've got them. And then you can figure things out. But that, that, that is what you want to do. That, that's what I do. Ulcerative colitis, again, it's all in the inflammatory area. Uh, all of this I was just said. Okay, so chronic inflammatory, uh, Disease uh, usually presents with bloody diarrhea, almost always. People between 15 and uh, 30 years old. It's in the sigmoid rectal colon area, so people are going to come in and say, all oh, this blood came out in their stool, and it can be very insidious. This really ruins lives. I mean, these people are running to the bathroom constantly. Their personal lives are a mess. Their work lives are a mess. So when they come in, I take them very seriously. Um, there are increased risk of colon cancer, probably a little bit higher in, in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's, but it's pretty close. I also want to mention that folic acid activation is abnormal at, uh, at the intestinal sites with inflammatory disease, even though this is in the colon, but even in the small intestine. So you always, always, always want to use methylated folic acid. And then that's known to reduce um, colon cancer risk as well. Um, substantially, actually, as is vitamin D, as is vitamin A, as are omega-3s, and a zillion billion phytonutrients, which are in the powdered products, which is why I always give them. Um, so I'm going to skip this. So this, these are some of the things that I might recommend. Uh, certainly a multivitamin, just to cover the baseline there. I'm going to skip to the mo most important things. The betazyme, the enzymes are very, very important for anti-inflammatory effects, very good for pain. Some of these patients also get pancreatitis. And an old treatment for pancreatitis, which you sometimes hear, is the use of pancreatic enzymes. They use them. It's in uh, you know, the um, De Gaon and De Gaon book of medicine. It's like right there, give enzymes for pain and inflammation of the pancreas. But also, it reduces inflammation in the colon. And again, it helps these people absorb better, reduces inflammation. The um, SBC2 with the Saccharomyces boulardii and Bifidobacterium. Bifido has a greater affinity for the large colon, by the way, than acidophilus. Okay, it's a little clinical side note there. The frontier biotics, though, with all the different lactobacillus species, all these different bifido species, you want them in there. You got to give them microgon. Um, you know, it's even thought that these inflammatory diseases may have been caused by antibiotic overuse in the 50s, um, because these people have such resistant uh, antibiotic resistance. But that's also historically where you see the the spike of these diseases at the time antibiotics were introduced and really pushed. So the turmeric plus, I want to jump to that. I want to mention too that I read a study that it helps perpetuate metformin's drug effect. So metformin is glucophage that's used commonly in diabetics. Um, it's never needed. It's almost never needed, but if they're on it, they won't need nearly as much if they're taking turmeric. 
Um, lipoic acid, by the way, in my experience, works much better than metformin. So lipoic acid, you know what the side effect is of too much? Take a wild guess. Hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, right? So you can't go, well, you can knock someone out, but it's, I've never done it, or IV I have, but if you give someone, you know, uh, two, three, four, 500, 1,000, even 1,000 milligrams of lipoic acid with synergists, you are gonna lower their blood sugar very nicely. You're gonna start to protect their nervous system because we know that lipoic acid offsets diabetic neuropathy, but also other neuropathies. And, and lipoic acid is a fat and water-soluble antioxidant, so it gets in every compartment of the body. We want to be using DHEA, these inflammatory bowel diseases and celiac disease. That one thing is, is really dramatic. Pregnenolone, I haven't seen it as dramatic, but it definitely can make a difference, but the DHEA, and it's, again, it's well-studied. It's anti-catabolic. That's why you want to use it. And uh, the zinc lozenges, I like them. The, um, you know, they've got the gluconate in the citrate form. Gluconate is actually more of a topical effect. And you want a topical effect in inflammatory bowel disease. You need the surface area managed. And then the citrate, you get more of a um, wide body effect with that. Okay. And of course, vitamin D. With anything that affects skin and repair, um, and when the body's really trying to go through repair, you have to give vitamin D. Because you know one of the basic effects of vitamin D is that it has to do with proper cell turnover, as does vitamin A. And those are, again, super important for repair of tissues. And in these inflammatory bowel diseases, what you get is such a fast turnover of abnormal cells, the body makes abnormal cells. And the risk of cancer and the body not being able to manage that is less, particularly if the person is not sufficient in vitamin D, omega-3s, turmeric, and all the zillion flavonoid elements uh, and other types of plant phytonutrients found in these, uh, the, the poor products, the poor powders. Diabetes, uh, we've been talking a bit about that already. Do you know pollution can cause diabetes? Yeah, I was asked to write this chapter. Someone calls me up and says, you know, I want to interview you for this book on diabetes uh, and the role of pollution. Can you talk about it? I said, absolutely. Right now, I said, no, call me tomorrow. And then I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. So that whole night, I'm studying, and I found all these studies. I couldn't even believe it. Basically, the pollution pollutes the beta cells of the pancreas. Boom, can't make insulin, and you're diabetic. So it's actually thought to be possibly more of a problem than sugar intake. But why don't we, we don't have to choose. We can say both. <laughs> so that's big time. So you want to detox these people when others, other nutritionists are not. You know that. You want to detox them. Um, all these different signs and symptoms of, uh, of diabetes, I won't review right now. But there are a lot of them just because of time. And here's uh, some of the, uh, the foods, but you know, what you want to do, and I, I sell these in my office, the glucometers, you want to have patients with blood sugar issues take their own glucose because they will be able to check, check their glucose against the food, which on the glycemic index is a low glycemic food, and guess what? They get a hyperglycemic reaction to it. My own mother-in-law, she had a low glycemic reaction to white bread, and she had beef steak, and it was like hit the ceiling. You know, uh, and of course I was trying to show how smart I was, and I wasn't so smart because it went the opposite direction. So you want to check the person's foods and see what they actually respond to. These glycemic index lists, they're not accurate. Okay, you've heard of the glycemic index, right? Okay. They're just not. So I just want you to be aware of that. And you can, you can purchase these glucose things very inexpensively and, and sell them to your patients. The laboratory, we're looking at hemoglobin A1C. I'm going to skip past this. Um, yeah, okay, hemoglobin A1C, which is a several-week average of blood sugar. And if you want a two-week average, you can do, do fructosamine. The, the glucose uh, blood test is just glucose for that day, right? So a person does not need to fast if you're measuring hemoglobin A1C because that's an average of several weeks. However, they can have low blood sugar some days and high blood sugar on another and good on another, and their hemoglobin A1C might still come out fine. But if you do the fructosamine, it's only two weeks, so you might catch things. Or use your common sense and say, this person's blood sugar is all over the place. So I'm not gonna believe the tests. The tests are not everything. The tests are not everything. I don't mean to say that they are. Yes, Doc? Yeah, it's okay when it comes back. You reminded me of something. Well, no, vitamin C, for example, I want to mention, this is really good you mentioned this, vitamin C helps regulate blood sugar, and it's an anti-inflammatory. Do you know why vitamin C helps regulate blood sugar? For a lot of reasons, but one reason is 
biochemically, and I, and I know Jamie's son is the chemist. If I'm wrong, I'm in trouble. Uh, good, he's not paying attention. Um, glucose looks similar to vitamin C in structure. So our ancestors used to make vitamin C in the body, but we lost the ability to make um, galunolactone for something or other enzyme, and we can't anymore. So then it became a vitamin, a vital amine. It's not an amine, but a vital substance. So if you have enough vitamin C, it helps to regulate and dilute out glucose if it's high. Plus, we can go on all day with the mechanism. So you want the buffered C capsules there. Did you remember the yeah, point? Yeah, I remember the C peptides. That's okay. You, you C peptides. Oh, C peptides. C peptide is different than C reactive protein. Right. So C peptide, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, no, I don't usually do it. But if you want to know if the pancreas is making enough insulin, you fast the patient and you do C peptide. Um, I'm going to have one more question only because of time. Eli, go ahead. Why buffered vitamin C versus uh, like soda meal and sorbet? Or yeah, no, that, that probably would work too. Yeah, no, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. So um, that's it with the labs. Uh, of course, diabetics tend to be on the acidotic side, so you're probably going to need to be careful with um, making them ketotic. Uh, but they tend to also have the, the sugar in the urine and uh, the ketones in the urine, the hemoglobin A1C may be above 5.7. 5.7 is considered borderline. And I tell my patients, again, so your normal sugar here, and this is diabetes, and you're borderline, but the damage that, that is super obvious here, but it's more obvious here, and here we can intervene. And they're waiting, well, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. Yeah, you are, but the thinking is wrong. I think he's just wrong among a lot of the doctors, too. OK, so um, Neuropath Ease contains a lot of uh, nutritional synergists that help protect the nervous system, which is a, a key area to protect, obviously, in these uh, individuals. Uh, sugar solve as well in terms of glucose control. Um, you want to Sometimes diabetics don't respond very favorably to high doses of omega-3 fats. So sticking to krill oil at lower doses first and just kind of seeing how your, your patient does. Um, let's see. The rest are pretty self-explanatory, I think, uh, and all pot potentially important. These are just um, immediate major considerations. Again, like if you're having a bad day and you need to know where to start, open up the book and say, that's, that's pretty reasonable. That means you need to have some of those things in your office so that you can make them available for sale to your patients, right? Do all of you have a decent stock of nutrients in your office? Who has it? Really? Why doesn't that, Why wouldn't you have nutrients in your office? I'm just curious. Yeah. Oh, I, are, you, I you are you asking who has? Them? Yeah, who has oh, nutrients? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I've I've consulted with some people. They don't have anything there. I say, why? They don't have any room. Like, what do you mean? You you don't have any money either. You need to have the supplements in your office. You need to make them available because also people don't follow through sometimes. But their chances of obviously complying are better if you can give them the thing, right? Okay. So all this is uh, the rest of the supplements. We're going to hit the thyroid now. So we know Hashimoto's thyroiditis is an autoimmune thyroid problem. It's the most common cause of thyroiditis. It's mostly affecting women. I find a lot of people with Hashimoto's, they never knew it. Just look at it on the blood and checking those antibodies. And um, the, the thyroid disease is usually, it can be secondary to other autoimmune diseases as well. If you have one autoimmune disease, the, the chances of you having a second autoimmune disease are very good. So, you know, with thyroid, it basically goes like, like a seesaw. So TSH is here, thyroid hormones are here. So if thyroid hormones, if it's hypothyroid, the TSH is elevated. And if it's hyperthyroid, the TSH is not elevated. And if they're like this, it's not a thyroid problem. It's an anterior pituitary problem, usually. It's a pretty good rule of thumb. And then, of course, there's the antibodies, thyroid peroxidase, which is a selenium-dependent enzyme. You don't want people having antibodies against the enzymes they need. So thyroid peroxidase, ASE, is, is what the, you know, that's the enzyme. And the thyroid globulin peroxidase as well, if they have antibodies against them, they don't work well. So the thyroid peroxidase needs um, all the B vitamins, for example, or several of the B vitamins. It needs zinc, it needs vitamin C, even lipoic acid, selenium A. We'll see, helps thyroid peroxidase work. That helps the body convert T4 to T3. So T is tyrosine, and the, the four is four iodines. You want it deiodinated, so the, the cleaves off an iodine, so you have 
T3, which is several times or eight times or however many times more potent than T4. And let's keep going. Hashimoto's, okay. So dental amalgams are definitely a risk factor, metals in the mouth. Uh, I also measure, I measure everything, uh, mercury vapor in my patient's mouth. They say, Dr. Wald, should I spend $9,000 and get my fillings removed? I'm like, hmm, maybe. Let's do this test. And if I put that tube in there, it sucks up the vapor. And if there's metals on, I'm like, yeah. If there's no metals, I'm like, no. Save the money. Take a vacation. Um, <laughs> iodine supplementation alone can restore thyroid function. And iodine supplementation can cause thyroid disease. So I measure iodine in the urine and the blood with patients. So iodine increases the autoantigenetic potential of thyroglobulin. In other words, it can work in a reverse way. It can be useful if someone's deficient and not good and cause thyroiditis if someone uh, does not need it. And of course, these conditions at the bottom, celiac thyroiditis, diabetes type 2, and many other diseases may be associated with thyroid disease. Let's go to the nutrition. Um, so right here, uh, actually, there's better, a better uh, way to talk. Oh, yeah, can I, please? Um, here, over here. Yeah. Uh, Where'd you go? <laughs> if you're on Tim Freud. Yes. Okay. Can you take iodine? I was told by somebody that, you know, a health professional to take iodine either or. You know, just take, take it every day, even if I'm on Synthroid. Well, okay. if someone's on Synthroid and they're leveled out on Synthroid, which is the most common, you know, thyroid hormone replacement, um, if they have the goal of getting off of that, which many patients do, iodine might be in your repertoire of considerations, no doubt. So, um, yes. But they, they might. Coach, you said if you take too much, it can be high, you know. Yes, high too high much high. iodine can cause yeah. either hypothyroid or hyperthyroid. Yeah. But if you've been on it for like 38 years. Yeah, 38 years, I think you're safe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, probably some traces of it, yeah. Um, maybe not. I'm not 100% on that one, actually. So um, cruciferous vegetables, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, uh, broccoli, uh, they can interfere with normal thyroid function and cause hypothyroidism, okay? Even though they're super healthy for other things, if a person has hypothyroid, I misspoke for a moment, if you have a normal thyroid, you're usually good. But if you have hypothyroid, then these uh, particular uh, vegetables, uh, because they are goitrogens, they can block thyroid function, causing hypothyroid, and either a palpable goiter, or cis and or goiter, or difficult to palpate goiter, but certainly low thyroid on a test. Does cooking them affect them? Yeah, it makes them less goitrogenic. Mm -hmm. All right, wrong way. Okay, let's move on. So Hashimoto's is associated, as is hyperthyroid, which is the opposite, with bone loss, um, so, uh, selenium is needed for T4 to T3 conversion. Zinc is also needed for that conversion. Vitamin E helps the conversion of T4 to T3. Um, let me just skip a few things here. We talked about iodine a bit. Uh, you don't have this notation. I made it this morning. But the tests actually measure iodide. Iodide is the active iodine. And that's what's in the potassium. It's potassium iodide, which is what Nutritional Frontiers have. That is the best one. That's what you want. And uh, we need between 90 and 100 micrograms of iodine per day, uh, depending on if we're children or adults or if we're pregnant or we're lactating, which obviously it's going to be higher if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, between 220 and 290 per day. And um, just something to know. So this was a study regarding the potential influence of selenium, copper, zinc, and cadmium on L-thyroxine. Basically, what you would guess, metals are evil. They interfere with thyroid function. You, you know, you need to test for them. And everyone with autoimmune, they may not have been the cause of autoimmune disease, but that person's body is going to have a greater susceptibility to absorbing them. Most common causes of these metals are fish. Then they'll tell you, I hardly eat fish. Then you'll say, well, that's bioaccumulation. Uh, or you breathe. You know, there may be other sources uh, as well. OK. So you want to look at this chart here, because it shows you where the, some of the nutritional conversions are and what's required for the thyroid. We're going to skip hyperthyroidism other than that the hyperthyroid tincture is very good. The thyroid complete may be appropriate if you believe that your patient requires iodine. 
I believe there's like 76 micrograms in there, something like that. And um, then as we just complete, I wish I had more time to talk about this, uh, just to hit on multiple sclerosis, which I think is the last condition, just a couple slides. So multiple sclerosis is a condition where there is degeneration of the white matter in the nervous system, which is the myelin. And uh, we believe that the number one cause of multiple sclerosis is probably Epstein-Barr virus, um, which caused degeneration. But there's been a number of bacteria and other viruses been, that's associated with it. It also can, uh, demyelination is definitely, definitely can be caused by metals as well. There's just several other diseases. You also see that multiple sclerosis is common in celiac disease. Well, not common, but it occurs higher in, uh, in persons with celiac disease. And we know that gluten can cause white matter lesions. There was a study in the Journal of Gastroenterology that showed white matter lesions in people with gluten. They took the gluten away, and the white matter lesions were gone. And then uh, there's all genetic predisposition. There's other dietary considerations like aspartame. Maybe it's vaccinations. Who knows? But I look at all of those things. And then um, I, I will put a person on a ketogenic type of diet. So I'll, I'll use the MCT containing whey protein uh, product, the Shupa Shake Protein, because that will put someone into ketosis very quickly. Anything neurological other than diabetes, you want to use the Super Shake, because that will put someone in ketosis. Ketone bodies are fuel and reparative elements uh, for the central and peripheral nervous system. So you need to get them there. Yes, maybe they need gluten removal also. Probably they do. So just something to think about. Dairy products, usually an adverse association there too. Vitamin D is a essential. Um, there's something called a swank diet. You can look that up. Basically, it's a clean diet. But um, we want the active B12 folic acid because we need those for myelin repair. Uh, the neurotincture, because there's infectious uh, considerations, the microgon. Liver, phase one, phase two activity is always dysfunctional in people with MS. Um, all the products I would use, uh, there's a possibility, am I going to mention this? No, I'm not going to go there. Um, definitely omega-3s. We talked about the whey protein, and we need the enzymes, not just for digestion, but for anti-inflammatory effects. Again, vitamin D, we can't emphasize it enough, because vitamin D is a ner nervous system uh, stabilizer. Also, low vitamin D predisposes people who are exposed to Lyme disease to a worse course of Lyme disease. So here's just a, a reiteration of the supplementation. We also want to be using um, uh, the uh, phosphatidylcholine, which we'll find in the Brain Boost 2 product, along with a lot of other nutritional synergists that are just super good for central nervous system function, for neurotransmitter function, for reducing inflammation. Um, could talk all, all day about the, the, the amazing combination of nutritional synergists there, including this particular herb, but we can't. The liver clear details are here too. It all just works for MS. Anything neurological, ginkgo as well, which increases blood flow to the brain and the nervous system. If you don't have blood flow, you can't get nutrition in. Same thing with arginine. Arginine increases nitric oxide, dilates those blood vessels, improves circulation to the brain, also important for the heart. I think there's arginine 725 or something like that that uh, is made here. OK, and the neurotincture. As far as rheumatoid arthritis, we don't have time to really talk about it. But it is the same as everything else, really. There's nothing different here other than probably focusing on the, uh, where is it? It's up here. Oh, the HA uh, Plus product because it's got all the basic ingredients and the synergists for joints. And then the rest of the nutrition I've mentioned in the notes will reduce the inflammatory and immune modulating effects. So you can manage those, which I've listed here. So sorry I had to rush a couple last slides. But I want to thank you all for listening. And I'm happy to take some questions after. We've got about 20 minutes. Do we? Because I'll talk all day. Yeah. OK. So questions, let's start with that. Remember, this is your time. Yes, ladies first. Got it. So lowering of the, can you talk any lower? I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> what? So <laughs> LDL. So um, anything that controls inflammation will probably lower LDL. Um, polycosinols, there's a zillion plant, um, phytonutrients and the powder products, all of them help lower cholesterol. Um, in the, uh, we have the cholesterol red, uh, product here too. I mentioned earlier had the red rice yeast, but along with that, it's got these polycosinols, extremely well studied to uh, lower total cholesterol, and that happens 
by lowering the total LDL and by increasing HDL, and probably also by lowering triglycerides. And um, the phytosterol complex, I mean, this stuff is so good that I remember several years back, the Annals of Internal Medicine had this whole argument article there. First of all, how well the polycostinols worked. They looked, worked better than the statins, and how they were trying to turn it into a medication. Yet another nutrient that doesn't work, that they want, you know, so that, that's what I would say. So the, uh, the, the cholesterol red would, was where I would go with that. And there was, yes, Joe? Selenium with thyroid is bad? No, I don't think I said that. Oh, okay. Did there I misspeak? Or some buildup of metals, and of the metals, you listed selenium. Oh, uh, as something you would give. Oh, my my apologies. So, okay. Yeah, so selenium in the preferable form of selenomethionine is, um, first of all, it's, important, it's essential for moving T4 to T3. Selenium being an antioxidant, selenium helping phase two liver detox, so of metals if they happen to be implicated, so that would be used to use it, a reason to use it. Yeah? If you have the recommendation for Graves, would that, um, do you have someone who has Graves and type 1 diabetes, would that just be the same? Type 1 diabetes? Yeah, I would look at both the protocols, I'd superimpose them and I'd say what's the same, and then you want to look at that patient and see where you can manage them. The nutrition for uh, Graves' disease is very similar to Hashimoto's. The iodine is the more particular uh, consideration there, and there's probably a, bit of, a slightly greater chance of the, um, the hyperthyroidism causing bone loss than hypo, but both do. But is, is so you might... Type 1 diabetes even versus, I mean, I guess... Just... What's the question about type 1? How dare these patients have comorbid conditions? With Graves. How dare they? With Graves. So Graves yeah. and, yeah. and type 1 diabetes versus type 2. Yeah, well, what's, what's perfect as you superimpose these protocols is they, they, they do it. You know, you can give, you can give um, you know, turmeric plus for any of these conditions. It helps blood sugar, helps reduce inflammation, it helps tissue repair, and all these conditions. That's just one example. Um, m many of these just, they just cross over, which is what's in common with the autoimmune concept and the nutrition for repair is very common. And then yes, there are particular things that may be more valuable in one condition than the other, like a product with lipoic acid being maybe a slightly more important in a diabetic with neuropathy and hyperglycemia that's uncontrolled than in others, maybe? Yes. Two questions on iodine. You only get one. You only get one? Yeah, okay, get two if it's fast, all right. Um, you're an iodine test. Are you using the loading test, or do you just do it straight? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of using the loading test, so I don't use it. Okay. Yeah, so I'm just measuring the levels. Okay, and what about um, dosing with iodine? Are you using you know, 12.5 milligram dose? Yeah, the dosing iodine question is a complex one. It would take a lot of the time up. Okay. Maybe those of you who are interested in that, we may want to communicate about that. But um, I do sometimes do the iodine patch test, uh, which is at least something. We're putting iodine on the skin and waiting to see if it's uh, absorbed or not. That's some relationship possibly, and I do that compared to the normal levels I'd want to see in the blood and the normal levels I'd want to see in the urine, and I leave it at that. I don't do the loading test because sometimes you mess with people's chemistries too much, and I really, that's why I also give the, the stomach acid uh, enzyme containing products with food even though technically one could make an argument you take it before food, because be when you're thinking about food, your stomach acids start going, you th maybe. So others say no, not until food hits, so who knows? So if you dilute it with the food, it's less chance you'll cause a problem with a person who's stomach acid sensitive. The same sensitivity issue I, I'm a little concerned about. Okay. Yeah. Um, the celiac you mentioned and DHEA, um, yeah. are we, you know, with children or with like, for example, mm -hmm. if they have Right. You know, That's a very good issues. point. All right, so, so the point has to do with what do we do with these hormones with, with kids that are, you know, uh, prepubital? Um, well, I could just tell you what I've done. There are some kids that I see that they're suffering so badly and they're not getting help, I throw whatever I can at them. Um, and they, they seem to be breathing still, so that's good. Um, you know, um, I did look into melatonin's effect in kids that are prepubescent um, to see if that had any adverse effects when I was asked to write this magazine article thing, and I can tell you in that case, no. So um, it's, um, 
too much DHEA? Well, they might get like, let's say, ex exaggerated secondary sex characteristics, for example. That could be, could, but I've never seen it. And I do get a lot of, of kids with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's pretty safe. Yeah, but DHEA of all the hormones seems to be the one that pr produces more of the side effects. Yes? But you're on DHEA, um, I don't know what that means. Yeah, I don't know what that means either. So, um, you know, there are blood ranges, labs are a little different. Um, most of the time, I'm not even measuring the DHEA. You know, I start with, uh, if they're a little kid, I'll start with 25. If they're an adult that, you know, stresses me out, I'll still just keep them at 25 because I know they're going to have every symptom under the sun. So, and then I slowly just bring it up to 200 in terms of an oral dose. Uh, I'm not so concerned with what the, the blood tests say because the thing about hormones, and, and you'll see if you go to my website at, at intmedny.com, you'll see there. I, I was on, um, it was Channel 5 Fox in New York, and I was talking about uh, hormones, I think it was uh, estrogen, uh, or maybe it was testosterone, and then there was an endocrinologist on after me talking about the other hormone, and we both said the same thing, and it's true, is that hormone levels in the blood, um, they do not reflect uh, use, because you can, have thyroid, you can have thyroid hormone resistance, you can have insulin resistance, you can have DHEA resistance, pregnenolone resistance. If, if I'm the cell here, and this pregnenolone's going up, Hopefully, my body's going to become more and more and more and more and more resistant to balance out the overall effect, right? That makes sense. The same thing with all the hormones. That's why endocrinologists and, and, and oncologists they're still not measuring estrogens in, in women with even breast cancer because they know they, they don't match. It's not like they're high, you know. It's just they don't see that. I mean, sometimes you'll see it. Do you use a Dutch test. What's that? Do you use a Dutch yeah. test? Or is it Dutch test. I'm, I'm not sure what Dutch that is. Test. Oh, urine metabolites. I used to use that quite a lot. So there's all kinds of ways. You know, the urine metabolites, as I remember them, they check the three, um, yeah, the three estrogens, and then there's a ratio predict. That's a real old one. I remember telling that to an endocrinologist. She laughed so hard. I thought, you know, she, her head was going to explode. But then I showed her the, the research, and then she wasn't laughing so hard anymore. But uh, it's, it's valuable. If you're really, really overly concerned about the patient and you want to know what those numbers are, fine. I would rather people spend their money on the nutrients they need, the, the lifestyle changes that they need, the therapies they might need for me or joining the gym or whatever it is, than on tests that won't, that won't really change much. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Questions? Yes. Mike. Are you, uh, are you still doing the workshops uh, these days, uh, like currently? Uh, you mean the workshops I mentioned earlier? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes. So, I have a very good presence where, where I practice. So people will call and say, I want to see the blood detective. Is that you? I'm like, yeah, it's me. I love that. I love it. Because it's a branding that I can stand behind, you know? Because when I think of it, and I'll answer your question in a minute, it makes me work harder. And then I can fulfill on the branding because I have a software that is detecting. So you're not just saying you, do, you, you are a thing and not fulfilling it. So I do a lot of talks uh, in my neighborhood, um, more and more these days. And um, people love the talks. You know, uh, you want to have, if you can have some sort of a slideshow, that'd be great. But keep it, you know, no more than like five slides for an hour and just, just talk. And um, yeah, so yes, I am. Mm -hmm. did, I, did I answer your question? Mike? Yeah. Yeah, John. If uh, 200 uh, milligrams DHEA is safe? Um, 200 milligrams is a, is a therapeutic dose. You know, that's a dose where you're going to be changing the chemistry of that patient. It is safe. Again, some people will come in with a, you know, a woman might come in with a mustache, and I will say, sorry, and we have to shave it and reduce the DHEA, and I'm not kidding. Um, but since you mentioned it, and I don't mean this as a joke, I did have a woman call me up, and she said she had some kind of a problem. So I had her come in, and at that time I was working with several physicians, including a, a woman, and she had a clitoral enlargement from the DHEA, and she was not kidding. So, but that completely resolved once we took her off the DHEA. And then we had the nerve to start again at a lower dose. And then everything was fine. Is there any benefit in uh, 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 there's a girl with uh, fasciitis, like in foot, for DHEA? Is that any benefit? Plantar fasciitis? I can make up some reason, John, but not really specifically. Um, for plantar fasciitis, what I would do is um, there's these mechanisms that you can have people stretch the plantar fascia out, uh, DMSO. Liquid works really well for plantar fasciitis because it's an ontophoretic agent. It pushes in the tissues. It's very anti-inflammatory. Uh, the turmeric uh, with the uh, piperine in it is, is fabulous for that. 
um, anything real key for that. Um, the, a lot of people with, with autoimmune disease, a few of my MS patients have that as well. So I find that when you fix what they need, a lot of these things reduce because the plantar fasciitis is just another inflammatory manifestation of an overall inflammatory state. So, but that's what I would say to you. Okay? You have a different topic today. Yeah, topically, yeah. Yep. And ultrasound is really good for that. Have you ever recommended the uh, B complex and they go back to their other practitioner, the GP, and then you get their blood work and it says B6 or B12 yeah. is too high? Yeah. Uh huh. What, what do you have? I love when this happens. I've had this the neurologist take my patient. Oh, the, it's always the neurologist. So yeah, um, usually it's the B12, and the patient comes in. You can see the sweat, and I said, I said, so you went to your neurologist, right? So your B12 is high. Like, how did you know? <laughs> so yeah, for some reason they're not getting it. If I look under the microscope and I see those cells are large, I know the B12 is high because it's not getting in the cell. But having said that, as long as the person isn't deficient in folic acid, the B12 is not a danger. So somehow they just, they think it's just wrong because they categorize all nutrients into this one category. If you take too much, it's bad. It's not vitamin A, it's not vitamin D. So yeah, I see it a lot. Um, yeah, I, I try to prepare for it. I, I, I even, Mike, have a little index card that said your neurologist is wrong, your high B12 means nothing. So when the person sitting in front of me, I'm like, hold on a second. And then I say, what does it say? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then I draw, draw the picture of the cell just to show them it's so common. I hear it so much that I made an index card. So um, I show them, I draw the picture of the cell, and I say, your numbers are high out here, which is not getting in. If you give them activated methylated B12, you can actually lower their B12 levels in the serum and plasma because you push it in the skin. How's that? So that works. Now, B6 may be another story. I just had someone call me like the week before last, I think, about B6. And uh, B6 can cause a B6 neuropathy, um, which is um, irreversible. So. The problem is, it almost never happens in people that have a high serum level of B6. But if you ever see that, and it's not uncommon if you actually check it, it's very easy to push the B6 levels over. Um, you, gotta, you gotta stop the, six, the B6. So just a, again, medical legal kind of thing. That's what I do. As if they continue with the deficiency, when they continue with yeah. the symptoms. Yes. That's, that's a great point. So if someone's been on a statin drug, we know that statins, if you look in the physician's desk reference, you know that book that's this fat and this much of it is side effects? <laughs> this is intended effects? Um, CoQ10, ubiquinol is the most common uh, of the, all the deficiencies, followed by a beta carotene and the other carotenoids probably, and, and so you don't hear this much, other fat soluble nutrients. So people have a history of being on statins. I get their fish oils right, I get their D, their A, there are fat soluble nutrients, the melatonin at night, that's really good for heart, um, and um, polycostinols and everything else I'm gonna do. The CoQ10, obviously, and am um, I missing any? And vitamin E. Those are the key ones I wanna make sure are correct uh, post someone being on statins, or better yet, they know that if someone has intolerance to statins and you wanna improve it, they just load them up with, with CoQ10, and they generally tolerate the statin now. Um, other we used to do that where we used to take the person off the statin, then we'd load them. We found it worked a little faster, but you can improve their tolerance. It's a tolerance test. If someone is responding that way from a statin, you just reveal that this person needs more CoQ10, which is used in every single cell of the body, right? Because it's ubiquinol, it's ubiquitous. So very important things to know. When a person tells me, a patient says, I'm intolerant to that fish oil, I think, oh, so you're not, you need more lipase enzyme. Or um, if they say that they, I don't know, can't digest uh, their, their whey protein product, then I may give them more enzymes, which also contain uh, stomach acid, betaine hydrochloride. So these are very important things to know. I might reduce the doses, of course, but a lot of the intolerance symptoms tell me where to go. If I'm doing detox with people, and I say, listen, I need you to tell me your symptoms of detox, because that might point me to what organ systems need more focus. And then I look at that relative to questionnaires, relative to the blood detective labs, uh, and all that. And then I do a nutritional visual examination on them. You know, if they've got, they're losing their hair, they have dry skin, they have, you know, dry earwax, you know, these are all omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies. They may be hypothyroid symptom deficiencies. So I go from head to toe on my checkoff list of dozens and dozens of things. So by the time you do this nutritional visual, you really have figured out a lot. I did, I think, three or four shows that are up on my blog on disease, diseases you can see in the mirror. 
And um, I'm going to give you also something here that might help build your practice, and then we'll end, is um, one of the things I do uh, with my consulting clients is, is to make sure that they can you know, write articles for different periodicals and to build up their, their reputation. And there's something called HARO, H-A-R-O, helpoutareporter.com. And when you go there, you'll see different uh, segments, maybe lifestyle, health, technology. And then there's, there are reporters looking for experts to talk on topics. So one morning, it's my day off, and I'm sitting in my kitchen, uh, and I get a call. And it's um, ABC World News Tonight in New York. And they say, we would like you to do a show on, have you, first thing, have you ever heard of a diagonal crease in the ear? And I say, yeah, that's cardiovascular disease. I said, there's a lot of things. He says, really, you know them? I'm like, yes. Can we come over today? And I'm like, literally like in my pajamas. I'm like, mm, can we do it tomorrow? So the whole crew comes over. I found these guys like 10 seconds prior to their call by just answering one of the, the little things on it. Uh, what, what, does, uh, what does it mean to have a diagonal crease? I typed it out, took me a minute, said go, and then the phone rang. And then I have this, you, you could see it on my website. You might not recognize me because I had hair then, but you'll see it there, and it was pretty great. They spent seven hours in the office to film seven minutes, but I got like, I don't know, 300 patients, something like that. So um, you can look at all of those things as well. And one last thing, in the subject section, when you want to respond, they get lots of inquiries. You want to put in that subject section something original, something that's very catchy for them to open it. Because once when I had a, um, I you know, paid this, this company to tens of thousands a month, and they said, they told me about this, and they said, you know, maybe you'll get one call, maybe. I'm like, well, I got all of these dozens of calls. They're like, what? I said, yeah, I just, I just made these original titles up, and it caught their attention, so be original. You know, there was one person that once a uh, magazine that wanted to know about the effects of estrogen upon, you know, sexual function and vaginal tissue. And, I, and in the subject section, I put the incredible shrinking vagina. And, you know, that <laughs> got them to call me. And, you know, so I, that's how you get them in, you know, like empty blood diseases, you know, they don't exist. But, I mean, they do, but they don't. So anyway, thanks again. I hope you enjoyed the content and I hope the, it was an appropriate amount of uh, practice management and it looks like we have one last question and we're going to end it there. Again. Oh, HARO, H-A-R-O, healthoutareporter.com. You can't miss it. Okay. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much.